All right, I see that we're a couple minutes past the hour, so let's go ahead and get started. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Thomas Vague, and I'm a project director with the Inclusive STEM Ecosystems for Equity and Diversity, otherwise known as the ICEED program, here at the American Association for the Advancement of Science. On behalf of this initiative, I would like to welcome you to today's workshop, Peer-Led Team Learning, How Enlisting the Aid of Student Leaders Increases Student Success. Today's workshop will feature presentations from Dr. Anna Freiman, Dr. Kimshi Hickman, and Dr. James Beckbar. Before we jump into the workshop, I have a few housekeeping notes. Uh, this presentation is being recorded. The recording will be made available in the coming weeks on our website at triplasius.org. And the slides are posted and available on the website now if you'd like to follow along outside of this presentation. You will also receive an email with a link to the recording uh, when it's available. Please note, uh, we will transition to a Q&A and discussion session uh, following the presentations, but those breakout rooms will not be recorded. Uh, additionally, we do have closed captioning for this event. Uh, you can view the full transcript by clicking the CC button at the bottom of your screen. And for those of you who are new to AAAS IUS, this initiative seeks to support faculty, students, and the greater undergraduate STEM education community by disseminating research and knowledge about STEM teaching, learning, equity, and institutional transformation. We invite you to learn more about the AAAS IUS initiative on our website and hope you will engage with our commun community as future contributors. You can also follow us at, on Twitter at IUS Program and on LinkedIn to stay up to date with our latest events, blogs, and workshops. Okay, and now we will shift over to our first presentation of the day. Without further ado, I would like to welcome Dr. Anna Freiman, uh, who is Emerita Professor of Chemistry at Northeastern Illinois University uh, to share her presentation. So Anna, over to you. Okay, so please, uh, next slide, Thomas. So, um, PLTL is a method that is additional to the lecture. That means that uh, the lecture continues to be in the same way and these additional sections of peer-led team learning. And what is peer-led team learning? It's an active engagement of learning that is facilitated by an undergraduate peer leader that actually completed the class successfully with an A or B grade and guides a group of learners in the process of solving problems. So it's a very active learning experience for the students and at the same time, uh, create leadership role for the peer leaders and actually actually some of the peer leaders that were in the past are actually participating in the work and I could have seen his names. Next slide, please. So there are six critical components in order for the PLTL model to be successful. And they are important, each one in its own right to make the whole program really successful. So first of all, the sessions, the workshops, or sometimes the recitations are integral to the course. That means they are parallel of the material that is taught in the classroom. The workshop is parallel in the material that they are covering there. The instructors are closely involved. That makes a big difference in any of the other uh, support system for students because the, the faculty is uh, directly connected with the peer leaders themselves. And the peer leaders are prepared for the role and support it over time. A student that just finished a class with an A or B grade was very successful in the classroom, but doesn't mean that it can lead a group of learners. So actually the instructor helped facilitate the teachers there, not teachers, uh, helps the, the, uh, the peer leaders in facilitation techniques, trying to understand all the scaffolding that needs to be done in order to understand the problem that sometimes is intrinsic in the students. Some students have that scaffolding, but some students that are not successful in the classroom miss those steps to reconnect the material in order to succeed in the problems. The materials are challenging to promote discussion. Many times they are prepared by their own faculty. They are available in the, in the website of PLTLIS, workshops that are prepared, that are parallel to the material that is taught in chemistry and general chemistry, organic chemistry, physics, and so on. If you are interested, you can actually visit the PLTLIS. There are many workshops prepared uh, by some for peer leaders and directed by faculty. It's important, uh, the organizational arrangement. You see, and when I'm going to talk a little bit uh, about that and um, 
I think Kim, she on her presentation will discuss more about the organizational arrangements that are needed in order to optimize the implementation of PLTL. And of course, there is need for institutional support in many aspects, like the location and the pay for the pillars and so forth. Can I please have the next slide? So I, I think that one of the challenging uh, times for, for us as, as professors is that we stay the same, but students evolve. And we're actually preparing students for jobs and technologies that we don't even exist, or even we don't know what the problems are going to be. So how we prepare students in order to be global learners and being able to transfer the skills that they have in one subject to another subject. And I think that that is an, a, a very important task that we have as faculty. Can I have the next slide, please? So if there is time, we can actually talk about the challenges that we encounter in this new generation of students. And of course, everyone knows about chat GPT, right? That is available for everyone and how we introduce that as part of the toolbox that the students have. Next slide, please. So we, you hear probably about the 21st century skills that, need, that students need to acquire in order to be successful. And I just mentioned a couple of professions, but it's for every profession. So right? those skills of the 21st century are important for the students to acquire in order to be successful in whatever, whatever they want to do. Next slide, please. And those are the 21st century skills that I published everyone and probably you have seen them is critical thinking, communication skills, creativity, problem solving, perseverance, a very important one, collaboration, and of course, information literacy and technology skills and digital literacy. And I think PLTL offer a large amount of those skills in the implementation of PLTL by the peer leaders and by the group themselves they acquire a lot of many of those skills during the participation of the, in the PLTL program. Next slide, please. So uh, PLTL provides communication and reflection. They need to work together in a team. They need to listen to each other and they need to, they need to have good oral and written skills because otherwise they can communicate in the, in, the, in the team. Of course, problem solving. And the important thing is the critical thinking, right? It's about having a problem, being able to conceptualize that, analyze the problem, transfer the information that you have from, from different courses and integrate it into the problem. So it needs reflection. You need to reason. And of course, leading to the conclusion. But the answer of the problem is not just the only thing that we need. We need each one of those steps in order to be successful in the analyzing problems. Next slide, please. And of course, collaboration. And the little uh, uh, cartoon that you have in the side, sometimes we sit in the same room and we talk about the same thing, and it seems that there are different languages. And I think it's really important to learn how to collaborate in teams. Any of the new advantages technologically and in chemistry or in physics or whatever you are, they are done in teams. So the importance of the ability to effectively listen, respect, and in a diverse team of people, right? And develop cognitive flexibility and actually accept that there is, accept that there is a diversity of way of thinking. There is no one way to solve a problem. There is not only one approach to solve a problem. There are many different approaches, and sometimes we can learn a lot from different approaches. And I think it has the understanding of the value of individual contribution. We might be thinking about the same thing. I may have a solution, but maybe another solution could be a better way or integrate the two together. Uh, and uh, of course, the development of leadership. We need leaders to lead those uh, different teams. Next slide, please. So what is the role of the peer leader? That is the big actor in, in this uh, method. Uh, first of all, there are the liaison in between the lecture and the, and the seminar, right? Sometimes students are overwhelmed by the amount of material that is covered in a lecture. Sometimes they feel this too long. I think that our students have a very short uh, attention span, right? It's like uh, being in the small cartoon. Uh, they don't, they, sometimes they can last for a 
50 minutes or sometimes an hour and 15 minutes of lecture and some of the concepts are mixed. And here comes the role of the peer leader to really be a liaison between all the concepts that were learned to the seminar. And I think also, also they are good communicators. Sometimes I give a lecture and I think it was amazing even though there was active learning and the peer leader tells me mm, uh, the students really miss uh, what happens. So what is the role of the, the, the peer leader is basically to facilitate. They don't give answers. They just facilitate the connection that they already know and uh, make, it, make them understand the process the process of the that is about the final is and them understand the process to solve a problem. It's not about the final answer. It's not to get to the right number. And it's that is different than having the solution guide for a book. In the end of the chapter, there is the problems, and then you have the solution book, and then you can see if your your answer matches the solution book. And actually, here is about the process. The answer is important. But the most important is the process that you go from the beginning to the final answer, because that's the way you will be able to transfer the knowledge from one subject to another. Understand that that's not about the number that you get at the end, it's about how you got to that answer. What is the process? And the peer leader is there to facilitate that process. They are not giving the answer, they are just helping the students to connect with previous knowledge, to connect to things that they need to take into account in order to be able to answer. Uh, and consider the answer only after a process of learning has occurred. And you heard all that, you, you listen to all the different answers and you get to a final conclusion after all that is discussed. Can you move to the next slide, please? So what is important is that there is no answer key. And sometimes that is a deterrent for the students because students want to know that if they do A plus B, they get C and they can check it. So either they go to a seminar or to a workshop and there is a problem and there are no answers and the peer leaders are not going to give them the answers. So what they learn during that process is to learn how to construct an answer, how to evaluate different answers, how to test for ambiguity and how to test for completeness. Right, and if you remember, one of the skills was perseverance. So how to test for completeness. It's not enough that I get an answer. I should be able to analyze different answers and then test for all the different ways of answering the question and then test for completeness. The next uh, slide, please. So uh, the, organi the, the organization is really important. I think Kim, she will talk more in detail about that, but I think that uh, it's important to know what is necessary to make PLTL workshop work. Required, uh, the workshop sessions require a space where the small group can actually meet. Uh, the, the workshops need to be scheduled ahead of time so students know what workshops they're going to participate. Ideally, the workshops takes two hours, but some schools cannot actually do it for two hours. So there is a range in between 45 to 120 minutes. Uh, it helps once a week. Optimally, it's six to eight students. But again, depending on the school and depending on the amount of peer leaders, the number of peer leaders that can participate, the number varies in between four to 424. And those uh, PLTL workshops actually were done also online during the COVID time. And what is important is that if you have a peer leader that is the first time that he is leading a group of students should have a smaller group. Next slide, please. So uh, I implemented uh, PLTL at Northeastern University in organic chemistry. Northeastern Illinois University is a public university in Chicago that actually is an Hispanic serving institution. And I was able to implement PLTL for that through a grant that I got for three years. And th during those three years, uh, one of the aims that I had is to, um, to uh, collect data and really realize if it's a successful program to retain more students, women and minority. So one of the first things I did was actually, um, um, actually what I, I, and I'm just reading the chat, so it's distracting me and I apologize for that. Um, so 
uh, what I first checked was how many students that pass general chemistry with a C succeed in organic one. And actually I realized that a very high percentage of the students that come from general chemistry having a C failed in organic chemistry because organic chemistry takes a lot of the knowledge from general chemistry without, without going into depth. And students that cannot carry the information from general chemistry to organic, they fail, right? About the different kinds of bonds, electronegativity and so forth. And um, so I implemented um, uh, the seminar, but at Northeastern, it wasn't mandatory. So students needed to elect to participate in the workshop and they needed to pay for participating in the workshop. And actually with the money that was collected from those what from those students that register for the seminar, we pay the peer leaders uh, for their participation in the in the workshop. So what was found is that 40% of the students took the seminar by choice. I mean, they are from the whole class, only 40% of the students took the seminar. 1% of students withdraw from the seminar and simultaneously from the workshop. And 1% of the remaining students fail the class. That means that uh, 99% of the students that were in the seminar passed the class with a C, with a B, A, B, C. Uh, and the rest of the students completed organic chemistry successfully. Overall, the attrition rate in the classroom was 50% from previous years. And I think that the reason for those 50% is because many of the students that would have dropped the class or passed general chemistry with a C were able to successfully complete the class. Uh, organic chemistry two in organic chemistry two was implemented in the following year, and forty four percent of the students took the seminar by choice, and that happened during the three years that uh, I was implementing the the uh, the PLTL program. Uh, interesting enough, I think that the most telling thing about how they felt the workshop helped is that one hundred percent of the students that took the seminar in organic one register for organic two. So they felt was something that actually helped them succeed in the, in the class. Uh, and 100% of the students who completed the seminar completed organic two success, successfully. Overall, the attrition rate in the class decreased by 38%. Also, I wanted to assess, besides the leadership skills that the peer leaders acquired during the, prom the, during the, the program, I wanted to know what, how much it helps the peer, the peer leaders in understanding organic chemistry. So they took the ACS exam, the American Chemical Society standard test at the beginning before they became peer leaders. And I asked them to take it after the semester where they uh, taught organic one or organic two. Some of them just organic one, some of them organic one and organic two. And actually there was an improvement of 25% in the organic chemistry, the American Chemical Society standard exam. Uh, I think that that's all for me. Yes, I think that that's all my presentation. Great. Thank you, Dr. Fryman. Right. With that, we are going to move into a presentation uh, from Dr. Hickman. Uh, Assistant Vice Provost for Retention and Completion at the University of Texan, Texas Arlington. Uh, if you'll bear with me for just one moment while I queue up the presentation. Good afternoon. This is Kim Shi Hickman, and I'm an Assistant Vice Provost at the University of Texas at Arlington. And I'm here to share with you some information about our peer led team learning program. Um, Peer-led team learning can be operated um, by faculty out of a department or there's a learning center model, and that is what I'm here to talk to you about today. First, the University of Texas at Arlington is the largest university in North Texas. Um, we're the second largest in the University of Texas system. That's next to UT Austin. We are in the heart of the DFW Metroplex. Um, we offer more than 150 baccalaureate, master's, and doctoral degree programs. Uh, we're a, a Carnegie One research institution, also a Texas Tier One institution, and we've been designated as an HSI and an Anapesi institution. Um, UTA is a very diverse campus, and we rank number three in the nation for ethnic diversity with with our student body. 
So to tell you a little bit more about peer-led team learning, Anna has already talked to you and described that it is a, a model in which, you know, a peer leader who excelled in the course is running a small group, but also working with faculty where the students facilitate uh, with the small group a packet of problems that the faculty has developed. So for UTA, being a part of the Learning Center has helped us to institutionalize it. It's institutionalized through our Academic Success Center. Um, funding for our peer-led team learning program is also provided through the Academic Success Center's budget. So one of the things that you get with the Learning Center model is that we've got dedicated staff who run our PLTL program. So we have a director, uh, Ms. Catherine Unite, who oversees the Academic Success Center where PLTL falls under. We have a full-time PLTL coordinator that we started with in fall of 2020. And with recent expansion for PLTL, we are funding another PLTL coordinator role that's actually going to be posted uh, within the week to hire a second person. So a benefit of the Learning Center model is that the Learning Center is responsible for that. Um, in addition, we recruit the peer led, the leaders that run PLTL, we hire them and we train them. Um, the leaders um, have the requirements of having successfully passed the course, um, also keeping a 3.0 cumulative GPA and also having that faculty recommendation, which is an important piece. The Academic Success Center oversees the registration process, and we also secure the locations for the PLTL session, small group sessions to have. And then we also oversee data reporting for the program. So I'll talk a little bit about our approach to faculty support. So what has worked here well for us at the university is having two levels of faculty that we work with. So first we work with the faculty coordinator um, within the department and we discuss PLTL, what we want to implement, where we have our high DFW courses and what the strategy should be. And then then that faculty coordinator helps us identify a faculty liaison who will be the person who will meet with the peer leaders once a week, who will develop the problem packets for the entire semester um, and basically develop that workshop content. And so this has worked well with this model where it has been great in helping us sustain our program is that looking at the top, you see the faculty coordinator, Dr. Lynn Peterson. Well, if Dr. David Ewing had to step out or were sick and needed to be replaced, then I would work with Dr. Lynn Peterson again to identify who is the next person who will be the faculty liaison. So the structure in that sense is sustainable and it keeps us going because there's still there's a department level commitment to having peer led team learning um, on our campus. So the faculty involvement for PLTL is that, you know, the course needs to be coordinated so that all of the students across the sections are, you know, having the same material at the same time. It's got to be integral to the course. Um, I highlighted close involvement from course faculty. Part of what makes PLTL so very successful is that faculty commitment to PLTL, and it has to do with the content um, that they're putting in the packet. Um, number four, I, I put in workshop content is challenging. It must be challenging. Um, it can also help students understand underlying concepts. So it doesn't have to match what they're talking about in class, which is typically what you would see in a supplemental instruction program, but it does have to be some underlying concepts that the faculty want the students to work on. Um, the other part that is um, really important for us is to pay, pay attention to logistics and just the financial support, and it should be at the highest levels of support. So we have that, I'm under the office of the provost, and we have it from the provost office down to continually support this program so that we don't worry what will happen to it in the future. So um, something that has assisted our faculty as they start are there are workbooks that the PLTLIS, which is Peer Led Team Learning International Society offers. Um, these workbooks are workbooks that are full of sample problems that can be used in workshop for content. And so we have been able to purchase those to give our faculty to look at for examples. In addition, if you're thinking about starting a PLTL program, there are also workbooks to use for training your PLTL leaders. So I wanted to put that in because that's very helpful information to know. For the PLTL leader, we have two roles. We have the leader who is working and they do two sessions a week, um, small groups of eight. We try not to go larger than 10 if we have to expand because it kind of makes the group dynamic 
um, disintegrate. But again, they have to have a 3.0 cumulative GPA, A or B in the course. They get a faculty recommendation. And they also have to be in good standing um, in the university as far as um, conduct is concerned. Um, then after they've been a leader, they can interview to become a PLTL mentor. And so these students, they after they've been two semesters as a leader, they can apply for that. And then they have some extra duties where they get to meet with the small groups of students per subject, and we're able to um, assign them projects. So our leaders make $13 an hour. Our mentors start at $14 an hour. So I wanted to talk about how PLTL can be implemented. We've had two different um, implementations on our campus. When we implemented Engineering 1251, which is an engineering problem solving course, it was embedded into the lab for the course. So all of the students who were in the course also had PLTL. This was a high DFW rate course um, that, you know, tried supplemental instruction, tutoring, different things, and they had not been successful for that course. But putting this into the lab and actually working with the faculty to identify that it was the students who were not calculus ready, who um, really needed to have the help. So they had that lab for PLTL and we saw um, a, a difference in our DFW rates. The other way to have PLTL, which is more common on our campus, is that um, the sessions are offered outside of campus. We offer students a selection between Monday and Thursday, 9 to 7, Fridays and Sundays between 9 and 1, where they can choose a session that fits their schedule. And we ask the students to go once a week. PLTL is the only program we have that's mandatory um, where attendance is taken and they are to attend once a week for the entire semester and therefore get the grade benefit. So this is what the structure of my team looks like. This is not the entire Academic Success Center, just the portion that relates to PLTL. So we have myself um, as the Assistant Vice Provost. Then we have Catherine Unite, who is the director. We have one PLTL coordinator, as I told you, and then you'll see new, we're adding a new position. This past year, we've had a range of between 58 to 64 PLTL leaders and six to eight students who have served as mentors. When it comes to facilities, um, most of our PLTL sessions are in the central library. Um, and so we're running several sessions concurrently at one time. Um, you can see here a table that is surrounded by glass board. Um, so that is what our students use. And then we have other spaces around the floor of the library that we have sectioned off with glass board. Uh, we have a, one classroom we have at our disposal. Um, that we use. And then if we we're growing rapidly, so we're probably going to have to be looking for some additional spaces for the 23-24 school year. But with the Learning Center model, um, the faculty are not left to have to find the locations for PLTL. We find that for the sessions. So I wanted to talk about how we are funded. So the support that we have for peer led team learning comes from designated tuition dollars. And so what that means on our campus is that a few years ago when UT Arlington was um, wanting to raise tuition, then you do a tuition proposal and you write what would those additional tuition dollars be for. And then a portion of that was designated for, for learning support, for academic support. And so that actually funds then um, our PLTL model. So it comes from that. And it, so, and then it comes from state money um, that does it. So that covers the salary for the two coordinator one positions that I told you about. It covers the leader wages, the mentor wages, materials, supplies, um, the training sessions that we have in the fall and the spring before um, we start the semester. I also give a travel stipend to all of the faculty liaisons of $3,000 so that they can um, travel to a meeting. Um, and that um, as an incentive to help them for all of the very hard work that they do that we're very appreciative of. Um, also, we have the PLTLIS annual conference and we will take staff and then we pay for leaders to travel. And if any of our faculty like to go to the conference, I pay for that as well. So that is the finances that comes for it. Um, what again is I think a benefit for Learning Center is that it's institutionalized and it's also institutionalized and it has permanent budgeting for this. You know, some of our faculty around the country who do it have to look for their own support to support their PLTL programs. And in a minute, you'll see how um, Dr. Jim Beckbar has very successfully found a way at the University of Texas El Paso to fund his program. 
So the disciplines that we have done PLTL with is engineering problem solving, general chemistry one, chemistry for engineers, um, pre-calculus, Cal one, Cal two, Cal three, general chemistry two, differential equations. We'll be moving, we're moving into organic chemistry as well. Um, PLTL works best with gateway STEM courses that have large sections that have high DFW rates and the model really does have great impact for those courses. Um, so just to tell you a little bit about how we look, this might be small for you to see, but for our attendance has been growing ever since we started, you know, with, with PLTL for the number of students who have, have been attending each semester and we've grown to be around 881 and then with the spring i think we're nearing a thousand students who are um, in the model what you see on the right are dfw rates and i kind of pointed out math 23 um, 26 that we we picked up uh, this semester and the pltl dfw rate was 6.9 compared to non-pltl which was 20.35 um, underneath that organic chemistry one the DFW rate for the students in PLTL was 35.92% overall, but it was 57.89% for students not in PLTL. So therefore you can see a difference. Our chemistry for engineering course here at the bottom, the DFW rate for PLTL 26.21, for students not in PLTL 37.05. So typically when we launch PLTL, we began to see a difference in those DFW rates um, initially in the first semester. So these are some future courses that we're looking at for PLTL. So accounting is one. Um, linear algebra, we're discussing anatomy and physiology, biology and physics. Out of those, probably what we will end up um, working with first is biology, physics and accounting for sure. Um, those are high DFW rate classes, but also classes where there is proven um, results from PLTL. So we'll be going into a breakout session here in a little bit. And the director that I told you about, Ms. Catherine Unite, will be with you. And you can ask her any questions about things that you've seen in the presentations. And then she may have some questions for you that you'll discuss for the next 30 minutes before you come back to the big group. Um, I apologize for not being with you in person. Um, you ask, is it live or is it Memorex? For those of you who remember that commercial, I had a very um, good colleague um, that also went to my church who died and the services happened to overlap this. So that's why I'm not with you um, live and why I recorded the video. So um, please bring your questions into the breakout session and we'll be happy to talk more about the Learning Center model, um, just about funding and about how it helps our faculty so that all they're responsible for is meeting with the leaders once a week and getting the workshop content done. We take care of everything else. Thank you. Thank you to Dr. Hickman for this presentation. Uh, I would now like to turn things over to Dr. Jim Beckbar, Distinguished Teaching Professor of Chemistry, University of Texas, El Paso. And I'll have your presentation up just momentarily as it loads. Thank you, Thomas. There you are, over to you. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much. Um, especially thank you for joining us today. Uh, I have quite a story to tell, a story about education pioneers. I've been a faculty member at the University of Texas, El Paso. You see a photo here. Uh, I've been a faculty member for 40 and a bunch of years more. Uh, the photo shows the beautiful Bhutanese architecture of our campus at the Southern end of the Rocky Mountains. I will talk today about how to support learning how to train faculty to utilize the creativity of student leaders. The success of our 23-year PLTL program in general chemistry shows how faculty can nurture strong student leadership and capture the creativity and entrepreneurial value of student leaders to facilitate learning in an, env in an environment that values diversity, equity, and inclusion. Next slide, please. I have a success story to tell you that is simply beautiful. 
Several years into the PLTL program at our institution, I began to ask the peer leaders, what will be your contribution to the literature on learning? They blossomed and bore fruit. Undergraduates can express their creativity if you invite them and if you provide the opportunity. Undergraduate students can be creativity engines. I teach the lecture section, which meets twice a week. Our mandatory PLTL workshop program is linked formally to the lecture. Linkage means that at registration, students choose a lecture and a workshop that fits their schedule. They cannot enroll in lecture unless they enroll in workshop. PLTL workshops meet once each week for two hours. This provides the opportunity. Next slide, please. This is a photo with our university president, Dr. Heather Wilson, speaking with the general chemistry peer leaders during our Leadership Training Institute before the semester started this most recent semester. If you oversee undergraduates facilitating learning in your course, you are creating leadership. You are developing a leadership engine at your institution. The process of facilitation for these students, these students become a resource. Leaders can and do create as well as lead. Do you need funds? Do you need funding to support your leaders or a system to finance your program? If you need such a capital funding opportunity to financially support your leaders or to finance your program, challenge your capable entrepreneurs to create written learning materials like problems, strategies, mock examinations, worked out solutions on their own unpaid time. These materials, because they are intellectual product, IP, these materials can be assembled and developed into sellable products to support your very program, your intervention, your facilitation of learning. Creating a 501c3 nonprofit to organize and sell these materials keeps you and the process above board ethically. It avoids conflict of interest and the appearance of conflict of interest and yields a viable means to self-sustain your intervention. Next slide, please. Here you see the covers of some of the workbooks that have been developed by our student leaders. The idea took us a few years to develop. You do not need a grant to do this, but if you have a grant or internal source of funds to start a peer-assisted intervention, think about using this idea to develop a financial support mechanism, something like our workbook project along these lines. Next slide, please. We started a PLTL program in the first semester general chemistry course in 2000. That's the blue arrow down at the bottom. <clears throat> it, this was supported by an NSF grant, MIE 9550502. Then in about 2008, another NSF grant, DUE 0653270, Project ISTAR, supported the start of the PLTL intervention in the second course in general chemistry and some of the other courses at our institution in 2008. As this second grant neared its end, insufficient internal funding in about 2012 for this successful facilitation intervention strategy required us to think outside the box, and it's a good thing. Grant funding can end, or it can have gaps. The process represented by the workbook project provides continuity and steady funding that is good for students and programs. Gaps in funding also mean a loss in institutional memory. The undergraduate peer leaders become graduates. 
and many of them move on. They take the infrastructural organization and know-how with them. This is good and it's bad. Good because they can remember and start their own program like Milka Montez has done at the University of Texas Permian Basin. Bad because they are your workforce, which goes away upon graduation. Unless you have the means to replace them and have them train your next crop of facilitators, your program can suffer. Please remember that if the institution provides you with funds, they can take it all away. When a new administration or some financial exigency comes into existence. Administrators and your champions move on. May I have the next slide, please? In 2012, a peer leader suggested a nonprofit legal status to separate the university, that's the professors, and the funding mechanism, our workbook project. This plot shows how the funding donated by the nonprofit for education called Lead for America Corporation has helped fund our program since 2012. Sales of intellectual product can do this. You can do this. Undergraduate students are altruistic and love to help others learn and love to do good for the benefit of others. Nothing would prevent this kind of intervention in English music theory, or some other so-called liberal arts course, where students facilitate learning interventions would promote degree success. The orange bars in this plot show the funding that has been made available to peer leaders to pay their hourly wages at the University of Texas at El Paso. In the last five years, the program has become self-sufficient. The orange bars, the small one at the bottom, show the developing program at the University of Permian Basin. Next slide, please. In a few seconds, I'm going to show a video, or that is to say, uh, our facilitators are going to show a video. The red arrow arrows in this, in these two pictures, show the workbooks that we're talking about, these 300 page, uh, help manuals that we provide to the students that are university student written. Watch for them. There's also a purposeful mistake in the video if you can, if the chemistry faculty amongst you can spot it. Okay, next, uh, we are ready for the video. So the video features Andrea McWilliams, Ale Belmont, Ashley Prieto. They are the speakers during the video. The Peer Leading Program in Chemistry here at UTEP is a program that is a, it's a mandatory component of the general chemistry courses where students are required to register for a workshop um, and they attend the workshop weekly for two hours and it's run by a peer leader who is their peer, so another undergraduate student, um, where they engage in group activities to sort of facilitate the learning of really challenging concepts in general chemistry. So some of the things we have to do as a peer leader is conduct a two-hour workshop once a week. Some of us have one workshop, some have two. And during workshop, we work with our students and we propose topics to get them talking about the material that they learn in chemistry. Um, our main responsibility is just to get them working on the material, practicing the material, and keeping that discussion going. The way that we interact with the students is we basically go into a workshop setting. There's 12 to 15 students and what we do is we mentor them. We're supposed to be their peers, so they're supposed to be able to approach us and talk to us whenever they need anything. The program challenges the conventional sort of education methods where like I'm the teacher and I'm going to teach you something. Um, it's more of a program where uh, I facilitate learning, so I encourage group activities, I encourage students to interact with each other um, so that they can learn how to master those concepts in chemistry and not just hear it from one person. What I consider my primary responsibility as a peer leader is to create that comfortable learning environment. I think one of the main things that I gain from being a peer leader is confidence. Um, I'm a lot better at talking to people and also working with each other since you work with so many students. You work with about 30 of your own students, but you also see 
countless number of students during office hours and during lecture. Being a peer leader is very beneficial because you actually get to network a lot with different professors. You actually get to meet other students who are also trying to pursue basically the same dreams that you are. It also helps with developing your leadership skills and your social skills. I think the main academic benefit that I got was time management. Uh, since I started as a freshman, I've really learned how to manage my time from working, being a peer leader, and being a student. And now that I'm a senior, I can see that. Um, it taught me how to study, looking at my students. Uh, in order for me to help them, I try to think of better ways to study and how to manage your time more efficiently. And I've also learned to work together as a microbiology major. We do a lot of group projects, especially for lab, and I've learned to work with the group and kind of take lead. The academic benefits of, of being a peer leader have obviously been that I've, I've built my skills in, in chemistry. Um, so oftentimes like I'll encounter a concept that maybe I didn't master so well while I was a student in the general chemistry course. And then when I find that I'm you know, planning activities for workshop that I realize that, oh, I have to master this even further than what I did when I was a student. And then that of course carries on to my other to my other courses to like sort of apply those critical thinking skills. I just applied to medical school this past summer and I would definitely say that peer leading helped me get into medical school. During my interviews, I know a lot of the interviewers were really interested on what I did and they were really surprised at all the things that we do. The peer leading program is really, really great for professional development. I think it offers uh, peer leaders a lot of valuable skills, um, such as how to interact with other people. Those are the skills that a peer leader is really taught, is how do you navigate the experiences of different people and how do you best get to them um, in order to improve their learning or to improve them, them as individuals. And I think that's a really important aspect of being a peer leader. I think I only have two more slides. Thank you. So you need to start the student facilitated learning intervention. You need to find those students who are who are altruistic and want to help others. Organize them into a creative bunch. Have those leaders start writing. Have them write on their own unpaid free un, unpaid time, not paid by your program, not paid by uh, your resources. You need to start a 501c3 nonprofit. Then you need to assemble the materials into a minimum viable product uh, so that you can sell that minimum viable product and donate which would normally be no royalties to authors. You donate those royalties to a university gift fund. That makes your intervention become self-sustainable. By all means, Use Lead for America Corporation, the Peer-Led Team Learning International Society, and the journal, the Advances in Peer-Led Learning, help you get on your way and make a, uh, a program self-sustaining. And you can contact me at Jim Beckvar, jbeckvar at utep.edu. The next slide, I think is my last. So there you are, there are some logos. Uh, by all means, contact me if you're interested. So that's my presentation. So we have a few more slides that we can show at the end of our breakout discussion groups. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Beckvar, and to all of our panelists today for sharing your experiences with PLTL. Uh, we will now transition to some breakout room sessions uh, for some Q&A with our speakers and further discussions. Um, your breakout rooms will be self-assigned, so you can choose your own, and they will be organized by speaker. Uh, I'm going to ask my colleague, Drew, to go ahead and open up the breakout rooms for us. Um, so you should see a pop-up on your screen now, um, allowing you to go ahead and select the breakout room. If you scroll down, you can see which one you can join. Um, if you don't see that pop-up, uh, you can navigate to the bottom of your screen, and you should be able to select the breakout room button. Or if you're running an older version of Zoom and don't see that button, just open up the chat and type the last name of the speaker that you're interested in, and we will go ahead and place you into that room. So with that, um, we'll go ahead and transition to those breakout rooms and call you back around uh, 322 um, for some final comments from our speakers. So have a productive discussion, and thanks again for joining us today. Hello, uh, welcome back. Welcome back. I see a couple people still joining. 
We should be set there. Okay, uh, before we adjourn, uh, we're gonna have some final comments from our speakers and facilitators. Um, Anna, I believe you're speaking first, is that right? Oh, but I think you're on you're, mute. You're mute. You're muted, Anna. Okay. Um, but let me just put it down. So uh, we have a society, the P PLET Team Learning International Society. We support the development of PLTL in different institutions. Uh, he and myself, uh, A. Dreyfus, which is part, we have the UTPB to establish the, uh, the PLTL model at their institution. Uh, we provide resources, a growing network and advocacy. The vision of PLTL is that peer-led team learning is integral to the excellence educational practice. And the mission is to force student learning through peer-led team learning by supporting practitioners and institutions. Uh, the peer-led team learning international society as a 501c3 designation as a non not-for-profit corporation. Uh, the next uh, steps to support is submit a paper to the PLTL IS journal that actually Jim mentioned. Uh, we prepare peer leaders for a series of webinars and uh, as on facilitation and leadership, actually there is a pre-conference workshop uh, to help uh, begin to prepare the peer leaders. And there is a PLTS version of facilitation that actually many of those techniques I myself used when I trained the peer leaders, uh, prepare leaders for specific disciplining, dis disciplines using existing workshop. And if you go to the PLTLIS website, you are going to see all the different uh, subjects that workshops are there, that workbooks are there help develop material in specific disciplines and interdisciplinary uh, areas. We can help to do that and create PLTL communities in the United States and across countries. The next slide, please. Uh, for more information, you can contact Jim at uh, his email, see the email address, gbeckford at utep.edu, or you can contact me at fryman at neiu.edu, and you, or you can contact Kimshi at uh, kimshi.hickman at uta.edu. And if you don't have time to write us, you can contact the information on pltlsis.org. And please, the next slide, hopefully you can come to our 11th annual conference on, uh, that is hosted at the University of Houston downtown and from May 31st to June 3rd, 2023. For more information, please go to the website www.pltlis.org. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. And uh, Jim, Catherine, do either of you have any final comments before we wrap up? Just to say thank you so much. We had a, a great discussion. Would we, you know, obviously we ran out of time, but I just I will put my email address in the chat. So if any of you have any questions um, outside of the session, please um, do contact me. And, and just we talked quite a bit about the importance of you know revisiting what the fundamentals are of PLTL, who to reach out to, who are the champions on your campus to start off with, how do you identify um, those courses to start off with in setting up PLTL, looking at sustainable models, you know, having the learning center that we have as a starting point, and then looking at some of the differences between PLTL and SI and other models. But I would love to carry on the conversation outside of this. So I will put my email address in the chat. Thank you so much for your time. Great. Thanks for sharing, Catherine. And Jim, do you have any final comments? Well, I, I want to thank uh, the AAAS uh, and you and your team for making this opportunity available to us. I very much appreciate it. I, I do thank you very much for having us. Um, some of the questions and comments were about how do you motivate students to join these workshops and engage during workshop. And fortunately, I had a couple peer leaders in this breakout with me, Ben Diaz and Sofia Delgado. Uh, and they were able to answer some of those questions. Um, I uh, wonder if, Sofia, if you are... Uh, can you unmute yourself and do you have any final thoughts or comments about our breakout session? Uh, 
a question came up about authorship and the students that participate in the work workbook writing benefit from uh, by receiving authorship credit for their work. They donate that work uh, without uh, compensation and they sign agreements to uh, donate and release their uh, their uh, the, the parts that they have authored. They are not compensated for their writing in these workbooks. So that yeah. basically, I think, unless Sophia can come on and say a few more words, that, that's what I wanted to say. And I want to thank the time. Thank you for letting us, I think I'm mute. No, you're, you. Oh, you I'm okay. So thank you again. Like I was just saying what James said, you know, for giving us the opportunity to present. I think it's a very valuable program that has succeeded in many of the campuses. So thank you for the opportunity to share our experience with you. Great. Well, I would really like to thank all of our speakers and facilitators today for taking the time to join us and to share your work with the community. Um, I would also like to thank everyone out there for joining us and participating in today's discussions and presentations. And thanks to the rest of our AAAS ICE team um, for helping facilitate today's meeting. Um, a quick plug, uh, please join us May 9th uh, for our next workshop, Transform Your Department Culture, Helpful Examples for Inspiring Change. Uh, my colleague will link to that in the chat and we will also be sending emails around. Uh, we have a survey link, which we are posting in the chat uh, and sending via email after this meeting. Uh, it should only take a few minutes, but it really does help us uh, figure out um, how to facilitate these and the topics that we should feature in the future. Um, and then last but not least, uh, keep an eye out for that recording. We'll be sending it around in the coming week uh, for this presentation. Uh, it's, it's, it's finally over 60 degrees over here in Chicago. So I think I'm gonna take a walk and think about everything we've learned today. Uh, but once again, thank you so much to everyone for joining us. And uh, as always, we always look forward to learning from you, our AAAS ICE community. So thanks and have a nice day, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank Tom. you. Thank you so much. Thanks.